my role today is to introduce Professor Walter Block, and the reason I have this honour is because my husband, Neville Kennard, was one of the professor's greatest fans. I'm not going to say so much about uh, Professor Block as his distinguished career and accomplishments as a student of Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard and the Austrian School of Economics will indeed speak for itself. No more than a week before Nev died, even though he was really sick, um, he made sure that Benjamin had the funds in place to ensure the presence of this very senior Professor Block at the von Mises seminar here today. Last year, Nev sponsored Professor Hans Hermann Hoppe, another of his favourite people and a controversial professor, to attend the first von Mises se seminar in Sydney. Nev described himself, as, as Jimmy said, as a preaching and practising capitalist, and in more recent years, a very dedicated and outspoken anarcho-capitalist. For those who didn't know Nev, he was a great stirrer and provocateur, as Benjamin will attest, and he loved nothing more than to quote from Professor Block's book, Defending the Undefendable, often creating a kerfuffle amongst his friends, contemporaries and whomever was listening. Another of Nev's recent and favourite topics was the idea of creating an alternative to the traffic jams that we all experience in Sydney by establishing um, pay road solutions. Another of Professor Block's ideas described in his book, Privatising Roads and Highways. Nev would often say when we were stuck in horrible traffic, um, how much would you pay to get out of this? $10, $15, how much? <laughs> anyway, I'm sure um, Everyone here today um, is keen to hear Professor Block uh, talk, and he, uh, his, his talk is um, described as an introduction to libertarianism, or libertarianism 101. And so without further ado, thank you very much for coming and um, being here today, and welcome to the lectern, Professor Block. Thanks for the kind introduction. I'm honored and privileged to be here. This is the first time I've been in Australia and I'm happy to learn you don't have to stand on your head. <laughs> and you don't have to eat kangaroo or ride them. Uh, I'm very grateful to Mr. Kennard for sponsoring this. I'm honored to be second in after uh, my friend Hans Hoppe, who I admire and revere and, and think he's a, a great contributor to Austrianism and libertarian theory. Uh, before I go any further, let me get in a commercial announcement, which is perfectly okay for us laissez-faire capitalist types. I brought two books with me all the way from New Orleans, and they were very heavy because I brought a whole bunch of them, so please buy some so I don't have to bring them back. Uh, this one is Defending the Undefendable, $15 Australian. This is um, Yes to Ron, Paul, and Liberty, which I'll be talking about right now, and that's 25 bucks. What is libertarianism? Well, the way I see libertarianism, first I have to say that if you get 10 libertarians in a room, you're gonna get 11 different views as to what libertarianism is. Uh, it's sort of like herding, uh, herding cats or something. Uh, so my own view is that libertarianism is uh, either a two-edged sword or two sides of the same coin. And on one side of the coin is the non-aggression principle and on the other side of the coin is private property rights. The non-aggression principle is pretty non-controversial. All it says is keep your bloody mitts to yourself. Don't grab other people or their property without their permission. Now if you ask the, the next hundred people that walk down the street, do you favor murder, rape, and theft? You know, they'll say of course not. And even if they do, they won't admit it. <laughs> but the the difference between libertarianism and other people is that we're really serious about that. We apply it to everything. We apply it to other people, other institutions, including government. Uh, the way I see libertarianism, uh, the essence of it is anarcho-capitalism because the government itself is a violator of the non-aggression principle because it, it tells people you have to pay taxes whether you like it or not. And then there are these, these excuses, well, 
you live here, you know, you've implicitly agreed. I didn't implicitly agree to anything like that. I never signed any constitution or any agreement that other people can take my money and give it to other people. It's just theft. If anyone else were to do it and not calling themselves government, we would know clearly that it's a violation of the non-aggression principle. But somehow uh, government is uh, free of, of this problem. Uh, the way I see libertarianism, there are like three or four stages. The highest is anarcho-capitalism, which applies the non-aggression principle to everything with no excuses, no exceptions, including government. The second one level down would be minarchism or minimal government libertarianism, which says, okay, there is a role for the government, and uh, the role for the government is to protect persons and property. And to that end, there are only three institutions that are justified, armies to keep foreign bad guys off of us, police to keep local bad guys off of us, and courts to tell who the good guys and who the bad guys are. People associated with the first, anarcho-capitalism, would be uh, Murray Rothbard, for example. People associated with the second one would be Ayn Rand and Ron Paul. Then the third one, a little bit below that, would be classical liberals, who would say, yes, so we, we have to have government, and it should include those three functions, but it has a few other functions as well, public goods, and and two or three other things. I'm not sure who I would put in there, maybe Robert Nozick. And then fourth, after that would be sort of free enterprises, but who make a lot of compromises and who say, yes, uh, we have to have the government do this, we have to have government do that, but they talk a good free enterprise line. I would include Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek here in, in, in that category. They make a lot of exceptions, and I think one of my lectures upcoming is an attack on Milton Friedman uh, and Coase and Buchanan, who I would also put in that category. Okay, so that's the first side of the coin, the first side of the libertarian coin, the non-aggression principle. But you need the other side of the coin also because suppose uh, I go and grab Sanjay's wristwatch. He's sitting in the first row and I just grab his wristwatch and he smacks me. Well, did I commit aggression and he was defensive or not? It depends upon who owns that wristwatch. If he stole it from me yesterday and now I'm repossessing it, then I'm the good guy and he's the bad guy. On the other hand, the reality is I never met the man before. Uh, he, I didn't take his wristwatch, he didn't take mine, and if I take his wristwatch, I'm the aggressor. So we have to have a theory of private property rights, otherwise we can't tell who the aggressor is and who the aggressor isn't. Well, the libertarian view of uh, homestead uh, of property rights is based on homesteading. This is John Locke, this is uh, Murray Rothbard, Hans Hoppe has made uh, magnificent contributions to this theory as well. And the idea here is you mix your labor with the land and uh, th there are continuum problems. How long do you have to homestead? How deeply? How intensively? Uh, can you put one corn plant every foot, every square foot, every square yard, every square meter, uh, every acre, every hectare? every square mile, what? And Murray Rothbard used to say, well, it depends upon the culture. East of the Mississippi in, in uh, the US, you have to farm more intensively because it's a f more fertile area. West of the Mississippi, you uh, don't have to farm as intensively. Okay, so you farm some land and I uh, domesticate a wild cow and now I have a, a, a cow and I get milk from the cow and, and you have wheat from your farm and now we trade. So this would be another legitimate title transfer. One would be homesteading, and the other would be barter, or voluntary trade. Anything voluntary, anything peaceful, as Leonard Reed used to say. So what are the other legitimate title transfers beside barter? Well, there's purchase, there's uh, gifts, there's uh, gambling, things like that. So you trace back all property to that, to that end. And one of the radical things I've done is uh, a thing called, um, oh, what's the word for it? I'm losing my marbles here, um, reparations. Uh, what about uh, blacks who were, uh, most of my examples are not gonna come from Australia because I'm not as familiar with that country as I should be, but uh, in the US there were black people who were enslaved. And now there are white people who have plantations in South Carolina and should the, this stuff be given to the black people? Well, Murray Rothbard's answer is, Possession is nine-tenths of the law. We assume that whoever is the uh, legal owner is the rightful owner, and it's up to the other guy to uh, prove that he isn't the rightful owner. 
and could this be done? Yes, so we can have reparations. It, uh, it wasn't that far back that we had slavery in the United States only 150 years ago, and if there's evidence that a specific black person who now lives in the Bronx, his great-great-grandfather worked in the plantation in South Carolina, and then there's some sort of evidence, well, he should get part of that plantation. Namely, it shouldn't have been given to the, to the white slave master's son when slavery ended. It should have been given to the slaves as punishment for slavery or kidnapping. Okay, so here we have what I see is sort of the bedrock, the basic principles of libertarianism, the non-aggression principle, private property rights based on homesteading and voluntary trade. And then the way I look at the world is through these eyeglasses of libertarianism. Any problem that comes up, I say, well, how does it match with the non-aggression principle? How does it match with the uh, homesteading private property? And then I, I might not have the answer. You have to do a little bit more research and thinking about complicated issues like, I don't know, abortion or uh, uh, blackmail or something, which I'll, I'll be covering later on in my lectures. But at least you have uh, some sort of grounding, some sort of background to approach the problem. And I think that this is very invaluable, uh, very important for libertarians to have. Okay, what I want to do is illustrate libertarianism vis-a-vis -vis or via Ron Paul. And Ron Paul is perhaps the, the person who has converted more people to libertarianism than anyone else on the planet. I'm not sure, certainly in the US, but my understanding is that Ron Paul's limitation is not just the US, it's the world. The only other person I would put in this category of converting masses of people to libertarianism would be Ayn Rand with her book, Atlas Shrug, which is the book that first converted me to libertarianism. I mean, the thing was published in 1957, and it's, I don't know, 105, uh, 55 years later or, or so and it's still selling hundreds of thousands of issues. She never considered herself a libertarian. She criticized libertarians as hippies of the right, but still that book is, is uh, the heart and soul of libertarianism. There is not a word in it that, that is a statist word. I mean, uh, it's, it's a magnificent book. If you haven't read it, I certainly recommend it. Okay, now what Ron Paul did, he, uh, he orchestrated his views around three headings. One was economic liberty, one was personal liberty, and the other was foreign policy. So let me go over them in that order. Economic liberty. For Ron Paul and for all libertarians, I venture to say, economic liberty means you can buy or sell anything as long as you have a willing uh, purchaser or seller. There would be no limits. Uh, in the extreme, you could have a market in used body parts. This isn't something that he stressed, but I'm sure he would agree with this. One of the big problems in the, in the US and I imagine around the world is that there's a shortage of used body parts, used kidneys, used hearts, livers, lungs, whatever. Uh, and, and this is sort of an affront to economists because you have people going into the grave with perfectly good body parts and other people dying for lack of them and never the twain shall meet because somehow it's seen by government uh, as uh, something unconscionable to trade. And you know, my view is that if it's okay to give something as a gift, why should it be impermissible to give it as in a trade? Uh, same thing with uh, prostitution. Uh, if it's legal to go to bed with someone, why is it illegal if you pay them or they pay you for it? It's uh, beyond uh, libertarian understanding. Uh, minimum wage would be another one. Uh, Ron Paul didn't stress this. Uh, he stressed the Fed, and I'll get to that in a second. But uh, the minimum wage, a lot of people think that uh, minimum wage is like a very good thing, and you're callous if you're against the minimum wage. And the way they see a minimum wage is sort of like, here's a floor on wages, and the higher you raise it, the more salary people get. And who could be against that? I mean, what do you, favor poverty or something like that? But the economic reality, the economic understanding of this is that it's not like a floor under wages and as you raise it, it raises wages. Rather, it's like a, uh, a barrier over which you have to jump to get a job. And the higher it is, the higher you have to jump to get a job. Because we economists have a theory of wage determination and it's based on productivity, marginal revenue product. Wages tend to equal productivity levels. If my productivity is $5 an hour, this means that if you hire me, your receipts go up by $5 an hour. So what is your opening bid? What is, if you're a capitalist pig, what will you bid for my uh, wages? What's the opening bid? 
one cent. The right answer is minus infinity. <laughs> Namely, I have to pay you an infinite amount of money for the privilege of working for you, but I'll accept one cent as a, as a reasonable facsimile, uh, as a starting point. But at one cent, then the entrepreneur makes $4.99 profit. So somebody else will say, well, two cents or three cents, and it'll be bid up to $5. It doesn't necessarily get there. Only in equilibrium will it be there, and we're never at equilibrium, but we're always moving toward equilibrium. Uh, if it's $4 an hour, someone will say 401. Uh, on the other hand, if, if the wage is $7 an hour and my productivity is $5 an hour, then anyone foolish enough to hire me loses $2 an hour and, and will have a, a lack of incentive to hire me. And if he's foolish enough to hire me, he'll tend to go broke if he does it once too often. And yet the minimum wage law is very, very popular among voters in the United States and Canada, countries that I'm more familiar with, and I imagine it's the same everywhere because people don't understand economics. Let me talk a few minutes about the Fed, because you can't mention Ron Paul's name and not mention the Fed. It's sort of, I think, uh, uh, against the non-aggression principle. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not really a, a violation of rights or anything. But uh, he's so associated with that. Money is a very important thing in the economy. Barter, the problems with barter is a thing called double coincidence of wants. If I have a chicken and I want a pickle, I have to find a person who has a pickle and wants a chicken. And the odds of that are pretty grim. <laughs> so instead, what I'll do is I'll trade in my chicken for something else, salt, that's more marketable, that everyone wants salt or sugar or something. And then I'll trade it in for the pickle or the chicken. So I'll make two trades. Well, then there became a competition as to what shall be the intermediary. And uh, the thing that was the intermediary was the most marketable thing, something that everyone, pretty much everyone, would accept. Bananas wouldn't make a good money because they, they rot. Um, diamonds wouldn't make a good money because you can't make change in them. Because if you break a diamond in half, you lose a lot of the value. I think you lose three quarters of the value. Uh, cement wouldn't be a good money, even though it, it, uh, you can break it up, and uh, because it's not precious enough per unit weight and volume. So whenever there was a competition between different trade intermediaries, Gold won out. Sometimes silver, but gold won out. It's, it's easy to tell gold from fool's gold. You can slice it up, uh, make change in it. It's malleable. It, it's got all sorts of great qualities for money. And money is very important because it's half of every trade except for barter. So money percolates through the entire economy. It's, it's crucial. Why do our friends on the left, the Keynesians, the statists, why do they hate gold? Why does Krugman uh, uh, and Keynes call it the barbarous relic? Why does Milton Friedman, who uh, wrote a book, Free to Choose, and yet when people were free to choose, they chose gold, and yet he's against gold? Why? Well, government has only three ways to raise money. One is taxes. The problem with taxes is everyone knows who's doing the taxing. You can't say, well, somebody else taxed you. <laughs> it, wasn't us. it wasn't us, the government. Everyone knows that. The second way is to borrow, and again, it's clear who's sending out bonds and who's crowding out other investments. The third one is counterfeiting, and no one knows. And uh, the great thing, the, the bad thing about gold is you can't counterfeit it. You have to create it. You have to dig it up somewhere. So what they did through uh, a whole series of historical events that I won't go into now is they got out of gold. Uh, uh, our man FDR in 1933 or 34 got rid of gold internationally. Our great free enterpriser Nixon got rid of gold um, for, uh, no, I'm doing it the, the wrong way. Uh, Keynes did it for individuals. Nixon in 71 did it for countries, gold bars. And we're off gold, and now we have fiat currency. And they can print as much of that as they want. And then they can blame uh, greedy capitalists or greedy unionists. Now, I'm no big fan of unions, but I don't think that union demands are inflationary. The, I'm a monetarist in the sense that I believe that the, the cause of inflation is monetary um, expansion. And the Fed is uh, crucial to, to this thing. And Ron Paul, I think, puts his finger right on, on, the, uh, on the, the most important thing for government because it enables them to do so much else that they wouldn't be able to do uh, and calling for an end to the Fed. He didn't get an end to the Fed, but he did have some sort of influence on getting a uh, monitor the Fed uh, bill passed, and hopefully that will lead to something better. Uh, 
I uh, am scheduled for an hour, but my thought is that I wouldn't go on for a whole hour because a lot of the benefit of me being here is not so much me babbling on because you can see me on YouTube or videos. It's more the interaction. So if somebody would tell me when it's about 40 minutes or so, I'll shut up because if nobody tells me, I'll just keep babbling, you know, <laughs> like verbal diarrhea here, so. <laughs> okay, so the first thing is economic freedom. That's Ron Paul's first plank economic freedom. The second one is personal liberties. Uh, I've already discussed a little bit about um, uh, pornography uh, or prostitution. Now, I have a daughter. I wouldn't want her to be a prostitute. I mean, the, the idea is sort of sickening. I wouldn't want her to have that kind of a life. I don't advocate uh, prostitution. Ron Paul didn't advocate any of this. What he favored was the legalization, which if, for some people it's a very subtle distinction. They think that if you want to legalize something, you favor the use of it. No. Libertarians can be very conservative in their personal habits and, and oppose personally pornography, prostitution, drugs, this, that, and the other, and also say uh, that people shouldn't be put in jail for voluntary acts between consenting adults. <coughs> and uh, happily in our country, uh, what is it, Colorado and Washington State not only legalized uh, marijuana for medicinal use, but about 15 different states have done that, but they've legalized it for recreational use. Ron Paul, a radical, not like the CIS or the Fraser Institute or Cato, which are sort of cop-out institutions, uh, <laughs> uh, favored um, legalization of all drugs. I mean, the problem is uh, not the, the drug itself, but the prohibition of drugs. I mean, have we learned nothing from the prohibition of alcohol? When we prohibited alcohol, uh, in, in the uh, 30s, uh, a lot of people were dying from bathtub gin, where the equivalent would be poisonous uh, uh, narcotics, and they would have fights. Uh, uh, I, I think the one good thing about prohibition, though, is you get a lot of good movies that way. <laughs> and that, that's the one good thing I can think about, the ban on markets and used body parts. Uh, you get a lot of drama. Will the little girl get the kidney in time to save her life or not? Whereas if we had a free market, of course she would. There's no, <laughs> there's no drama. So what Ron Paul is saying is we should legalize these things. Uh, the problems come about from uh, the prohibition. One of my favorite uh, historical characters is a guy named Lenny Bruce. Anyone ever hear of Lenny Bruce? He's the one that started the F word, the four letter F word in, in public. Uh, that's not what I love him for, but uh, he, he was a great comedian and he was pushing boundaries and he wasn't really a libertarian, but he died from uh, impure drugs. The cops knew it and they didn't tell him because they hated him because he would make fun of them in court about um, the court cases. So Ron Paul is very staunch about personal liberties. We should legalize anything, legalize freedom is one of his mottos. Okay, the third uh, area that Ron Paul is famous for is uh, foreign policy. And what I said is th that the, the, the second order of libertarians, the, the minarchists, minimal government libertarians who favor uh, government but armies, courts, and police, the idea here is that the armies are defensive, not offensive. And when Ron Paul says that, yes, he favors defense, he just doesn't favor offense, people then say, well, he's against defense. I don't know how it is here. I don't know what sports you play, but in some weird sport where you kick a ball around, I don't know, something like that. But in the U.S., they have basketball, and, and when the other team has got the ball, everyone's yelling, defense, defense. They can distinguish between defense and offense. But somehow in the political realm, when Ron Paul says that the U.S. Uh, military should be like a gigantic, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, Coast Guard, make sure no one attacks us, and that's it. I think there are like 195 countries in the world, or 185, I'm not sure, they, the number keeps changing. Uh, the U.S. has got soldiers in about 120 of them, the big ones. I mean, how would people in the U.S. feel if some other country, Australia, China, Indonesia, whatever, Portugal, had uh, troops in, in 120 different foreign countries, and, and they called it defense? I mean, uh, you walk through the airports in the United States and you see some guy in, in a soldier's uniform and people start applauding. That's not libertarian. That guy isn't defending us. That guy is uh, using bombs on innocent people somewhere in Afghanistan or Iraq or God knows where. 
that, that's not compatible with libertarianism. And Ron Paul was told time and time again, we agree with you on economics, we even agree with you on personal liberties, but this foreign policy stuff has got to go. The neocons in the U.S. are adamant, you know, the U.S. has got to be number one and we got to kick butt around the world. Look, if you were looking at the, at the Earth from um, the Martian view, from the perspective of Mars, and you saw one country that had soldiers all over the place and no other country had that, wouldn't you conclude that that is an aggressive imperialist country? I certainly would. And, but you, you have to have some sort of um, distance. Uh, you have to look at it from a scientific point of view. You just can't look at it from US, we're number one, we're going to kick butt. Now, what Ron Paul uh, was then accused of is anti-Semitism. Now, I've known Ron, I'm Jewish. I'm not practicing, but I'm Jewish. When the next Hitler comes along, I'll be on the list. It's, it's a reality. <laughs> Hope he doesn't come along, but if he does, I'm, I'm there. Uh, I've been friends with Ron Paul for 30, 35 years. Uh, I, you, you know, they have uh, this thing, Gaydar, for gays. The gays can tell if, if you hate gays. We have Judar, you know. <laughs> uh, I can tell, you know, if you sort of shake my hand and despise me anyway. I, I can tell Ron Paul isn't like that. I've been friends with him. He's, he's just written a, uh, what do you call it, an introduction for the Defending the Undefendable 2. I've got a new book, Defending the Undefendable, coming out. And instead of Hayek and Rothbard uh, giving introductions, Ron Paul does. Who are two of Ron Paul's favorite people? Who are his mentors? Who are his gurus? Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, both Jews. By the way, I shook hands with uh, von Mises, and I never washed my hands since. So if you shake my hand, you shake hands with Mises. I told that to someone in the audience. and said, well, let me shake your left hand. <laughs> Everyone's a comic here. He's not an anti-Semite. Yes, he doesn't want to have any foreign aid for Israel. And because of that, people say, well, he's, these are just cough drops. It's not drugs for those of you who are, <laughs> for the, if there's any CIA or FBI uh, out there, I'm, I'm innocent. Uh, look, uh, yes, the United States gives Israel something like $4 billion a year. But if you add up how much it gives to all the Arab countries put together, it's about $12 billion. So if you take $4 billion away from Israel and $12 billion from Israel's enemies, is Israel worse or better? Well, absolutely they're worse, they're minus $4 billion, but, abs but relatively they're better because their enemies have even less, uh, three times less than they have. So how, how is that anti-Semitism? How is that anti-Israel? Ron Paul is pro-Israel. I mean, he doesn't like every policy they do, but in, within Israel, the, not everybody likes what, everything that Israel does. Ron Paul emphasizes that Israeli sovereignty is being taken away from them. When, you know, when he who pays the piper calls the tune, you know, we pay them money. Same with Egypt. The reason Egypt is kowtowing to the United States is we send them a lot of money. Well, Israel has uh, lost its sovereignty. Israel is less able to defend itself than otherwise. Look, uh, in the 1956 war, uh, Israel uh, owned the Suez. And Eisenhower kicked them out of the Suez. If they had the Suez, uh, not, not the Suez, what, what's that little thing? Sorry? G the Sinai, sorry, not the si uh, Suez, the, the Sinai. The Sinai is about 10 times bigger than Israel. I mean, uh, when Israel wants to bomb somebody for building nukes or something, they have to get US permission. I mean, that's not defending Israel. So in, in these three ways, Ron Paul is uh, promoting liberty through foreign policy, through economic policy, through domestic policy. What I do in this book, in addition to underscoring those three major elements of what Ron Paul is doing, is I, uh, I wrote a lot of this stuff all through 2008, 2009, for the last three or four years. Uh, a lot of it appeared first on lourockwell.com, and I'm a senior fellow at the Mises Institute, uh, and I'm very proud of, of that connection as well. By the way, while I'm doing advertisements, it's probably a little distant, but if any of you people have uh, grandchildren or younger siblings or children in high school and want to send them to a college, in my college, Loyola University, five out of five of us are all Austro-Libertarians. Now, we have, uh, you know, uh, commies and pinkos and Marxists and feminists and uh, black studiesists. 
but they're in other departments. And, <laughs> and every school has got that. <laughs> but if you come to Loyola, uh, you could get to study with me and my colleagues who were, uh, at least will give you an alternative view that you might not get in other places. So what I did in a lot of the chapters, I'll say, well, who might Ron Paul pick for Supreme Court judge when Ron Paul gets elected? Or who might he pick for vice president? Or, or how should Ron Paul deal with interviewers who keep interrupting him and won't let him speak? You know, things like that, where I'm trying to publicize his career as presidential candidate, where I'm trying to promote him. Uh, and I, I want to uh, lash out at two types of libertarians. Um, one is the one who say that don't vote. It just encourages them. You know, th there are some libertarians who say voting is against the non-aggression principle. You're selling out if you vote. So we have to look carefully at what is the non-aggression principle. And my answer to that is suppose you were a slave and there were two, sla uh, 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 what do you call it, overseers and the master was allowing you, the slaves, to vote between overseer goody who will only beat the crap out of you once a week, or overseer batty who will beat the hell out of you every day and twice on Sundays, and he lets you vote, and you pick overseer goody. Does that mean you support slavery? Of course not. Just because someone's giving you a choice, I mean, you know, if a mugger comes up with you a gun and says, well, give me a $5 bill or a $10 bill, and you give him a $5 bill, it doesn't mean you support mugging. Right, it just means you'd rather give them five than 10, or you'd rather have overseer goody than overseer baddie. So I think that libertarians who say that voting is per se a violation of rights don't understand the non-aggression principle, at least the way I do. Uh, one of my favorite heroes in anarcho-capitalism is, um, oh, what's his name? Ah, I can't think. Uh, Spooner, Lysander Spooner, The Constitution of No Authority. Read that book, it's really blow you away, it's magnificent. He uh, defends that. Murray Rothbard was forever voting and uh, setting up the Libertarian Party and the Peace and Freedom Party and this and that and the other. So I, I don't see any uh, case, any Libertarian case against voting after Ron Paul uh, lost out to, um, what's his name, Romney. Uh, we had Gary Johnson from the Libertarian Party in the U.S. Now, Gary Johnson is no Ron Paul, but then no one is a Ron Paul. Ron Paul is unique. He's magnificent. He, he's just wonderful. But Gary Johnson's pretty good. I, he's not awful. He's way better than Romney, which isn't saying very much. Uh, and yet these Libertarians were saying, well, no, you can't vote for Gary Johnson because, you know, he's impure. And he was. He's a little weak on this and that and the other thing. But, you know, politics... See, the way I look at politics, and I think the way Ron Paul looks at politics, I mean, I can't put words in his mouth, but I think that he didn't really want to be president. I was afraid if he became president, he'd be assassinated because the powers that be don't much like what he would do. Uh, rather, what he was doing is using politics as a vehicle to promote liberty. Murray Rothbard used to say every four years for about a half a year in the U.S., people get interested in politics, so we might as well offer them something. We might as well use that as a vehicle to promote liberty. So I uh, reject the idea that it's wrong to vote. I reject the idea that you shouldn't have a libertarian party. It'd be better if they were uh, more pure than less pure, but, you know, you take what you can get, I suppose. Okay, I think uh, I've done enough to start us off. Uh, I'll answer any question on any topic, but, um, you know, uh, maybe if you would f uh, focus it on what I've said, it would be better, like, don't ask me about private roads, because I will be spending a whole hour on that, for example. Although, you know, it's a free country, uh, you've paid your fee, so you can ask anything you want. Hi, um, you talked a little bit about this, but I was wondering if you could expand on how libertarianism deals with inherited privilege, so inherited wealth and the benefits, uh, people inheriting the benefits of an injustice that was committed several generations ago. So could you just explain a little bit more fully? Could you give me an example of inheriting injustice? Uh, you use the slavery example, or even say somebody's grandfather stole something from somebody else, or even gra maybe not grandfather, maybe further back, because if people have the ability to buy things, but their parents buy them for them and their wealth was ill-gotten. Well, 
uh, slavery really was gr one grandfather stealing something from another grandfather, only what he stole was labor. And uh, I think that libertarianism is, is very radical in the sense that we favor reparations, which only the Marxists really favor apart from libertarians. And even a lot of libertarians don't because they think it's Marxist. But the, the, the uh, Marxists want to have reparations not on the basis of stolen property, but rather on the basis of taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor, which is very, very different. Um, and uh, not just Marxists, but a lot of people want to take money from the rich and give it to the poor on the grounds that somehow you'll enhance uh, human welfare because of diminishing marginal utility of wealth. Namely, a rich man will uh, light his cigar with a $100 bill and the poor man is starving. Uh, that kind of a thing. So if we take money from the rich uh, and give it to the poor, we'll enhance human welfare. Well, that, that's just nonsense because you can't have any interpersonal comparisons of utility. But look, if my grandfather stole a watch from your grandfather, and this is the watch right here, and it's got your grandfather's picture on it or something like that, th there's clear evidence that this was your grandfather's watch. I assume that your grandfather would have given it to your father who would have given it to you. Instead, my grandfather gave it to my father who gave it to me. And I would say you have a very good claim to get this. So libertarianism is a very radical theoretically, but in practicality it's less radical because the burden of proof is on he or she who wants to change property titles and the further you back you go in history, the harder it is to prove anything because you lose records. In Canada, they, they take uh, hearsay evidence from Indians, you know, the, some old Indian will say, oh, we used to own from here to there and they'll take that seriously. Uh, so what you have is Indian tribes in Canada that have claimed about 250% of Canada I mean, there's overlapping claims. So, you know, that's, that's just silly. But uh, we have this principle, like the Japanese um, Americans in World War II, when they were put in concentration camps in the U.S., and the Canadian Japanese, the same thing. And they had to sell their boats and their land at uh, land office prices because they only had a week to go. Well, there you have, I mean, 1941 or 1940 or whenever it was is not that far a ago. Now, this doesn't mean that the Indians in the U.S. get to own everything, or the, I guess the aboriginals in Australia. Uh, I'm not familiar with that, the aboriginal situation, but in the Indians in North America, look, right now, the U.S. has got 300 million people, and the place is empty. You get up into a plane at night, and there's a little light there, and that's Chicago, and over here is Denver, and it's just empty. When Columbus came, the, the estimates are there were only two million Indians. So how could they have homesteaded the whole planet, uh, not the whole planet, but the whole, the whole U.S. territory? They homesteaded very, very little of it, and, and uh, they didn't really plant uh, stuff. They just hunted buffalo and, and maybe picked berries or something like that. So uh, this would not mean that you have to give back the whole country to the aboriginals or to the Indians or to the natives or what have you. Uh, so I think that libertarianism is clear that we should have some sort of reparations or at least be open to that. If you can prove that you really own this watch, well, then you should have it. Hi, my name is Gerardo. Uh, my question is, how can we abolish government in our lifetime? That's a vicious question. Easy one. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, how can we abolish uh, government in our lifetime? Uh, <laughs> I don't think we can, and uh, forgetting about abolished government, how can we convert people even to minimal libertarianism with that in our lifetime? And I hate to say this, but I think we can't. And I think that the reason for it is sociobiology. Now, sociobiology is the theory that we are the way we are now because of what it meant to survive a million years ago or 100,000 years ago when we were in trees and caves. Let me give you a few examples of that. How many people here are afraid of snakes? Most people are afraid of snakes. How many people are afraid of bathtubs? What? Afraid of bathtubs? What are you, crazy? Nobody's afraid of a bathtub. And yet many, many more people die of bathtubs <laughs> than of snakes, right? Milton Friedman died of a bathtub. He slipped while taking a shower. He was 93. He hit, his head, he hit his head on the side. And on the way to the hospital, he died. Bathtubs are very dangerous. Snakes are not. So why are we so afraid of snakes? If you saw a snake there, you, you know, you, We'd panic if you saw a bathtub there. I mean, <laughs> the reason is because a million years ago, it didn't do you any benefit to be afraid of bathtubs. 
but it did you a lot of benefit to be afraid of snakes. If you weren't afraid of a snake and you went over and patted the snake, nice snakey, you know, you, you wouldn't leave too many progeny. So we are self-selected for being afraid of snakes, not being afraid of bathtubs. Let me give you another example. A lot of women, very beautiful women in their 50s, uh, actresses no longer get the, uh, the sex roles in the movies and they start bitterly complaining about that. Uh, why is it? Why, why uh, are women of 50 or 40 or 60 not seen as sex objects whereas women of 20 are? The reason is, again, sociobiology. There were, suppose there were two tribes. One tri they had the same opposable thumbs, the same brain capacity, the same muscles, the same everything else. Only one tribe really loved 50-year-old women. They saw a 50-year-old woman, they said, whoop de doo let me at her. <laughs> they saw a 20-year-old girl or woman, and they said, eh, unripe, eh. <laughs> That's not our tribe. That, tr that tribe is headed for uh, extinction. Our tribe is the tribe that said a 20-year-old girl, oh, wow, yes, a 50-year-old girl, uh. <laughs> So that, it's biological. Now, what, what the hell has this got to do with libertarianism? What it's got to do with libertarianism is that there are two ways we can cooperate with each other. One is explicit, benevolent. We see somebody coughing or with a Heimlich maneuver, you know, the, the choking, we, we'll grab them and, and try to help them. Uh, somebody keels over, we're going to call the, the, the ambulance. You know, we help people. Uh, we have charity. We're biologically, uh, uh, what's the word, um, hardwired to do that. Because our tribe, if you were sick this week, I helped you. I'm sick next week, you help me, our tribe survives. The other tribe, equal opposable thumb, brain, whatever, they don't help each other, they die. So we are hardwired from the devil ends. But there's another way that we can cooperate with each other, and that's not uh, direct cooperation or benevolence, it's indirect cooperation or the market. What happened with um, uh, Katrina in uh, New Orleans in 2005? What happened with Sandy in New York City, uh, the storm Sandy? Prices shot up. Prices of gasoline, baby diapers, uh, 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 orange juice, uh, ice cubes, whatever. And what was and, and we economists know that the function of higher prices is twofold benevolent. One, it'll call forth new supplies. See, right now, whether it's New Orleans in 2005 or uh, New York City in 2012, think of somebody in Minnesota with a whole truck full of uh, orange juice. He's got two motives to bring that stuff. One is benevolence, and the other is he can make a big buck if the prices rise. So if the prices rise, we now have two motivations to help the, the people uh, suffering from the storm, namely benevolence and profit. But what's the attitude of the uh, uh, Christie, the governor of uh, New Jersey, or uh, uh, the governor of New York State, or Louisiana? Price gouging, let's put him in jail. The other benefit of a higher price is the first guy, the first 10 guys in a Walmart, at the old prices, they're going to grab it all because they, they might need it. Who knows? Whereas if the price is triple what it used to be, instead of taking 10 gallons of water, you'll take one. Instead of filling up your whole tank with gas at $40 a gallon, you might take a gallon or two. Namely, we'll share it out among everyone. So high prices have got two benevolent effects. One, we share it out more equitably, more equally. Our friends on the left ought to love that. And secondly, it calls forth new supplies. But we're hardwired against that. They call it price gouging and everyone applauds. There was this case in, um, uh, Michael Munger tells this, uh, he's a professor at Duke, libertarian. He says there was this lineup in, uh, after Katrina in New Orleans and they were lining up for, um, <laughs> gallon of ice, ice cubes. And um, uh, ordinarily, a gallon of ice cubes costs, you know, 50 cents. And they were selling it for 25 bucks. And there was a long line, namely, the fact that they were online shows that they valued the ice cube more than 25 bucks. Otherwise, they wouldn't have bought it. Or they wouldn't have been waiting for it. So somebody has a cell phone, and he calls the cops, and he says, this price gouging, this is a guy on the line waiting to get it. I mean, Hans Hoppe says there are no contradictions in nature. This is a contradiction. Hans is wrong. I'm kidding. I mean, uh, it's, it's not a contradiction, but uh, people are so ambivalent. This is why it's like pushing a rock up 
the, what do you call it, the Sisyphus rock? You push the rock up the mountain, it comes down, you push it up, it comes down. That's why there are only uh, 150, 200 people here. There should be 20,000. Because what we're talking about is, is uh, civilization. And what they're doing is barbaric. They're violating the non-aggression principle, which is barbarism. The reason we have so much trouble, the reason we get our 1% of the vote, or maybe less in Australia because of this political situation, is because we're not hardwired for indirect cooperation, namely the market, because there were no markets a million years ago. So it's, it's a struggle. Look, I hate to be the bearer of ill news. Don't kill the messenger. I'm just trying to analyze this as best I can to explain why it is that we don't do as well as we can, but I don't care. I enjoy, I love promoting liberty. I love what I'm doing right now. I came all the way from New Orleans to do this. I'm, I love it. I write about it. If we win, that's great. If we lose, that's great too. I'm doing the best I can. So I would say to all of you, whether we win or lose or come somewhere intermediate, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we try to promote liberty. Um, on that point of uh, promoting liberty, um, I notice on the Mises um, uh, videos, there seems to be a lot of support for liberty in the, the southern states. Um, and maybe that's because of their, their history. And I think uh, you mentioned once, uh, God bless the South. Um, but I was just wondering, if, uh, if you look at another uh, subculture in the US, the rappers, I mean, uh, self-defense with guns, um, making money, uh, being all independent businesses, um, very love of gold. You know, where, where's, where's the libertarian inroads? Where's um, um, that kind of, um, why, why isn't the movement reaching out to them or why is it not connecting um, with them as perhaps it is with other parts of the US? Um, uh, the question is, why is the South more libertarian than the North in the US? I don't know, why, why is the, the subculture of the, the rap, rap community? Um, the what community? Rap, 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 hip hop, hip hop, um, R and music. Um, to, uh, maybe this is why. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys have funny accents. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Dre, Eminem, uh, Snoop, Snoop Dogg. These, no, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't answer the question because I don't understand it yet. Are, <laughs> I, are you saying that the South is racist? No, no, no. no um, uh, could, could you translate for him? This, this guy can't... Sp <laughs> What's his question? Music that appeals to younger people. <laughs> Music that appeals to young people? Yeah, it, it tends to be about guns and... And, uh... and, and rock and roll? Well, I'm not sure I'm answering the question. I don't really like to answer questions unless I'm sure that I understand them, but... I feel so inadequate, I can't understand the question. I'll try, I'll try, I'll try again. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try again. Um, this type of music, um, in their lyrics, emphasises things such as, I'm going to make it, um, I'm going to go out and, and make a lot of money, um, I've got my gun to protect myself from that other guy who wants to hurt me, um, look at me, I've got my gold jewellery, um, and I'm going to live large or, or live an affluent lifestyle. Um, those are the themes that I think um, resonate with, with libertarianism. It's a very, very large subculture um, amongst younger people. It, it influences here, it influences probably most places in the, in the world. Um, and I don't seem to see libertarians kind of um, mix, uh, reaching out to that subgroup where I really think they should because um, they're speaking the same language even though I think they may not know it. I now, understand the, I, I now understand the question, and I feel much better, because I, I seek understanding. <laughs> I hate to uh, expose myself here, but I like Mozart. <laughs> and, and, and when I hear rap music, I, I turn it off, so I'm sort of unaware of this, but you, know, you have to be aware of it somehow, uh, whether it's just through osmosis. So you, you're making a good point, but I think what a, a lot of rap music does, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, you're more into this than I am, is uh, well, we gotta get those hoes. <laughs> <laughs> Defend uh, the undefendable. Which, which is a, a, a violation of the non-aggression principle. <laughs> 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 a 
And uh, I, I think you're right that, that we should try, that some people, some libertarians should make efforts to reach out to this group, or we should have some uh, libertarians who are rap musicians and, and give a, a, a good rap. Uh, <laughs> about An example, example of a rap would be, have you seen the, the, the Keynes Hayek videos? Yes, the that, that type of music where it rhymes, although uh, the, the type of rap is usually a much uh, stronger language, but right. um, that kind of style of music is what I'm... Well, look, I support all avenues to liberty. I'm not into it myself. I, I, don't, I can't picture myself doing that. That's but, okay. You've answered, but, you've answered the question. But I, I okay. can't picture myself <laughs> writing a novel like Ayn Rand. Uh, and there are there is a libertarian literature of science fiction. Uh, I applaud all efforts to promote liberty in any way that we can. My own way is Austrian economics and libertarian theory. But I don't denigrate anyone else's trying to do it. And, and if you can do it in that way, that would be fine. Um, before I was talking about legalizing drugs, and I've oh, given that's another thing too. Sorry, they do. They they're very much um, the legalization of drugs as well. Well, no, they're I'm very not. much they're very much into the yeah. That, that, I'm not sure that they favor legalization because you have this Baptist and bootleggers kind of a thing where yeah. Well, they also into the uh, yeah. You know, they the, do the illegal thing, but they talk about it. I'm well, they, they yeah. talk about it, but like I, I uh, once several times lectured in black um, churches. And I said to black leaders, you know, young black men are being killed. They're shooting each other over drug turf. And you're the leader of the black community, uh, leaders of the black community, and you're talking about um, equal pay or something like that. You know, get real. I wasn't too popular. I was lucky to get out of there with my life. But, <laughs> but I, I think that we should make inroads to every group, and certainly black people or rap musicians or what have you. Um, one last question at the back. Well, I am giving six lectures, so you'll have more of a shot at me later on. Um, I'd like to come back to this non-aggression principle that you outlined in relation to Ron Paul. The economic liberty and the personal liberty aspects I get, but the, um, the non-aggression principle as you've interpreted it in terms of foreign policy, I don't get. And I guess to cut a, a long question short, when is it okay to use aggression in pursuit of liberty. And I'll give you some, a specific case. So if Alabama decided to reimpose slavery um, and decided it was legal and, and reimposed it, there would be um, an argument that Americans should go down there and use aggression to undo that aggression. Would it be okay for Canadians to come to uh, Alabama and undo that aggression or should they stop at the border and if your suggestion is they should stop at the border isn't that a collectivist concept so American Americanism is a collectivist concept whereas libertarianism is an individualist concept uh, thanks for the question I understand it fully you didn't mention rap music so we're okay <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of things I disagree with you on there. First of all, I don't think libertarianism is individualist, and I'm not against collectivism. It depends upon whether it's voluntary or not. Uh, if you're really against collectivism, you have to be against key team sports, because team sports are collectivist enterprises, and yet I'm in favor of football and soccer or whatever team sport there is, and I, don't, and I, I like individual sports, swimming and, and track running, but I, I don't see that as a libertarian issue. If we're really serious about being against collectivism, we should be against team sports, which is silly. So we're not against collectivism. We're against coercive collectivism. OK. Uh, and also on slavery, I favor certain types of slavery, namely voluntary slavery. For example, uh, my son has uh, got a dread disease, which will cost $5 million to cure, and I don't have it. And you, the questioner, have long wanted me to be your slave, and you're very rich. And you give me $5 million in return for me being your slave. Now, that's a slave contract, a voluntary slave contract, not like the Alabama thing or what happened uh, before the War of Northern Aggression. It wasn't a civil war. It was a war of Northern Aggression or a war to prevent Southern secession because um, a, a civil war is like the Spanish Civil War of 1936 or the Russian Civil War of 1917, where two sides both wanted to run the whole country. 
Whereas the South didn't want to run the North, it just wanted to be free of it. And by the way, there's a movie, Lincoln, don't listen to that movie, it's a horrible movie. Tom DiLorenzo has done yeoman work on this. Uh, Lincoln said, uh, what was it? I don't, I don't give a rat's rear end about slavery. I just want to preserve the Union. If I can do it by keeping slavery, I will. If I can do it by getting rid of slavery, I will. I just, I don't care about slavery. I just want to preserve the Union. So Lincoln is no, no libertarian. Now, with regard to uh, uh, somebody doing something bad and other people not liking it, my model here would not be that the government should do it because the government, according to the Ayn Randian principle, the government is just supposed to protect the people, its own citizens. That's it. It's not supposed to be doing good around the world. The model I would use would be, again, the Spanish Civil War, and it would be the Lincoln Brigade, to mix up metaphors here. What the Lincoln Brigade did was composed of Americans and Canadians, private people, who went over and fought on the, the communist side against the, the fascist side. I don't see much difference, but that's a whole other issue. So if, uh, if Alabama was doing something bad, individual Canadians or Mexicans should go in there and kick slave master butt, but the government of Mexico and the government of Canada shouldn't do anything because the government of Mexico and the government of Canada are supposed to be uh, protecting their own citizens. There was this wonderful thing, well, not so wonderful, actually. What happened in, in uh, the New York Times, there was a, a policeman who uh, saw a homeless man and he bought him some shoes and everyone was saying, whoop de doo isn't that great? It's not so great because he really violated his contract. What that policeman was supposed to be doing is stopping criminals. And what he did is he took time out from his job, without permission, went into the shoe store, bought some shoes, gave it to the man. Now, it sort of melts your heart. I mean, and you know, uh, I have fellow feeling as much as anyone else, but he did it on company time. He did it uh, presumably at the time when he was supposed to be looking for criminals. So I, I would disagree with you on several grounds, uh, the uh, collectivism, the, the slavery business, the, um, the government going in and being a do-gooder. According to this limited government libertarian idea that I understand, the government's sole responsibility is to protect its citizens. It's not supposed to go abroad uh, searching for dragons to slay, as one of the um, uh, American um, founders said, something like that. I think it was Jefferson. It's just supposed to protect its citizens. Look, if I hire you to be my bodyguard and you go give a homeless man shoes, you're violating your contract. You're supposed to guard me. Thanks for your attention.